Hello dear students, I am Dr. Meghna Shilke, working as Assistant Professor at Department of Biotechnology, KTHM College, Nasi. Today we are going to discuss an interesting topic from Cell Biology Unit of MSc1 Biotechnology Curriculum. The topic that we are going to discuss is Cell Signaling and Communication. In previous lectures, we have discussed plasma membrane types and we have seen the structure of animal, plant and bacterial plasma membranes. We have also seen the mechanism of transport across plasma membrane and we have also discussed in detail the mechanism of intracellular transport, vesicular trafficking and membrane trafficking. In today's lecture, we are going to see introduction to cell communication. We will discuss the general principles of cell communication and different forms of intracellular signaling. Then we will see in detail the mechanism of G protein coupled receptors and mechanism of cytokine receptors and associated signaling pathways. Now let's see the brief introduction to cell communication. As humans we are all aware about the importance of communication in our day to day life. Similarly, the multicellular organisms, the cells in multicellular organisms have to communicate with each other as well as with the external environment. This communication is mediated mainly by extracellular signaling molecules. Some of these signaling molecules operate over the long distances that is long range signaling and some of the signaling molecules operate over the short distance that is they signal only to the immediate neighboring cells. Most cells in multicellular organisms can both receive as well as emit the signal. Reception of these signals depends on the receptor proteins. Most of the cases the cell the receptors are present on the cell surface. The receptors which are present on the cell surface they bind to the signal molecule. The binding of signal molecule to the receptor activates one or more intracellular signaling pathways and it in turn it can lead to the change in gene expression. These relay chains of molecules mainly intracellular signaling proteins process the signal inside the receiving cells. The signal is then distributed to appropriate, appropriate intracellular targets. These targets are generally effector proteins. The effector proteins are altered when the signaling pathway is activated and implement appropriate change in the cell behavior. Depending upon the signal and the nature and the state of receiving cells, the effectors can be gene regulatory proteins, they can be ion channels or they can be components of metabolic pathway or they can be parts of cytoskeleton. Extracellular signals can act slowly or rapidly to, to the change in the behavior of target cell. Certain types of signal responses such as increased cell growth and division involves changes in the gene expression and it also involves synthesis of new proteins. Such changes occur slowly and they might take some minutes to hours. So such responses are slow responses. Uh, the fast responses such as changes in the cell movement, secretion or metabolism need not involve change in the transcription. And such changes occurs much more quickly. Often it can start in seconds or some minutes. They may involve rapid phosphorylation of effector proteins in the cytoplasm or they can be synaptic responses which are mediated by neuronal cells. Cell depends on multiple extracellular signal molecules. Each cell type displays a set of receptors that enables it to respond to corresponding set of signal molecules produced by other cells. These signal molecules work in combination to regulate the behavior of the cell. For example, some of the signals are required for survival of the cell. Some of the signals are required for growth and division of the cell. Some of the signals are required for differentiation of the cells. Cell depends on multiple extracellular signal molecules. Each cell type displays a set of receptors that enables it to respond to corresponding set of signal molecules which are produced by other cells. For example, combination of some signals are required for survival of the cell. Some additional signals can be required for growth and division of the cells and some different types of signals can be required for differentiation of the cells. If there is lack of appropriate signals, the cell can undergo a programmed cell death that is called as apoptosis. The receptors can be of two types, 
the cells with surface receptors can be extracellular or intracellular. This is the example of extracellular receptor which is present on the membrane of the cell. This uh, type of receptors are present on the external side of the membrane and they will bind to the hydrophilic signal molecules and they will lead to change in the gene expression by activating the corresponding signaling pathways. There can be other types of intracellular receptors which are present inside the cell. A small hydrophobic signal molecule can bind to such intracellular receptors and they can lead to corresponding changes in the gene expression. So receptors can be of two types, intracellular and extracellular receptors. Now the other interesting fact about cell signaling is, different types of cells can respond differently to the same extracellular signal molecule. For example, if we see the example of acetylcholine which is a neurotransmitter, it acts differently in heart muscle cells, it can act differently in skeletal muscle cells and it can further act differently in salivary gland cells. For example, acetylcholine leads to decreased rate of contraction in case of heart muscles. The same acetylcholine when it binds to skeletal muscle cells can lead to increased rate of contraction in case of muscle cells and in case of salivary gland cells it can lead to secretion of salivary enzymes. So the interesting thing about signal molecules is same signal molecule can be acting differently in different cell types. Now these are the different forms of intercellular signaling. The signaling can be endocrine signaling which depends on endocrine cells which secrete different types of hormones. These hormones which are produced by endocrine cells can bind to the receptor in the target cell and lead to the signaling in those particular cell types. There can be second type of signaling that is paracrine signaling which depends on a signaling molecule which will act through a local mediator and it will regulate the response in the neighboring cells. The third type of signaling is contact dependent signaling in which a direct contact between signal cell and target cell is required for signaling to occur. And the fourth type is synaptic signaling which occurs in neuronal cells. So the end of neuron will be in direct contact with the target cell and the uh, interaction will be called as synapse. So that is a synaptic signaling that is another mechanism of intercellular signaling. So overall these are the four types of signaling mechanisms. Now there are two types of long range signalings in the cell, endocrine as well as neuronal signaling. In complex animals, endocrine cells and nerve cells can work together to coordinate the activity of cells in widely separated parts of body. Different endocrine cells must use different hormones to communicate specifically to their target cells. Different nerve cells also can use the same neurotransmitter and they can communicate in highly specific manner. There are two types of long range signaling in complex animals. In complex animals, endocrine cells and nerve cells work together to coordinate the activities of cell in widely separated parts of body. Different endocrine cells must secrete different hormones to communicate specifically with their target cells. Different nerve cells on other hand can use the same neurotransmitter but still they can communicate in highly specific manner. So endocrine cells secrete hormones which will act only on the target cells which will carry the appropriate receptor for that particular hormone. So that will create the specificity in endocrine signal. In case of neuronal signaling, if you see, the specificity is created by direct synaptic contact between the neuronal terminal and the target cells. So the neurotransmitter that is the, uh, released from a particular neuronal terminal will act only on the target cell which is in direct synaptic contact with that particular neuronal terminal. And this will maintain the specificity in neuronal signaling. So despite using the same neurotransmitters, neuronal signaling can function in highly specific manner. So these are the two types of long range signaling mechanisms that is endocrine signaling and neuronal signaling. Now there can be different signaling molecules. The extracellular signal molecules which bind to specific receptors can be of different types. They can include proteins, 
they can be small peptides amino acids nucleotides steroids retinoids they can be fatty acid derivatives or sometimes they can also be dissolved gases like nitric oxide and carbon monoxide now we will see the three largest classes of cell surface receptor proteins the cell surface receptor proteins can be divided into ion channel coupled receptors g protein coupled receptors and enzyme coupled receptors the first class ion channel coupled receptors involve rapid synaptic signaling between nerve cells and other electrically excitable cells which as nerve cells or muscle cells this type of signaling is mediated by small number of neurotransmitters that transiently open or close an ion channel formed by protein to which they bind which will change the ion permeability of the plasma membrane so that is the first class that is ion channel coupled receptors the second class is enzyme coupled receptors these enzyme coupled receptors are either function directly as enzymes or associate directly with the enzymes that they activate they are usually single pass transmembrane proteins that have their ligand binding site outside the cell and their catalytic or enzyme binding site inside the cell the third class the g protein coupled receptor is the class that we are going to see in detail the g protein coupled receptors are named after a g protein which is associated with this class of receptors so all eukaryotes use g protein coupled receptors they are also called as g pcrs these form the largest family of cell surface receptors they mediate most responses to signals from external world as well as signals from other cells including hormones neurotransmitters and local mediators our sense of sight smell and taste depends on g pcrs so next time when you are smelling a perfume or when you are smelling a delicious food dish you should remember that you are doing that with the help of gpcrs in your body there are more than 700 gpcrs in human in case of mice there are about 1000 gpcrs which are only associated with sense of smell alone the signal molecules that act on gpcrs are varied in structure and in function they can be proteins or small peptides they can be derivatives of amino acids and fatty acids and photons of light can also act as signal molecules for gpcrs the same signal molecule can activate many different gpcr family members for example adrenaline can activate at least 9 distinct gpcrs acetylcholine can activate 5 different types of gpcrs and the neurotransmitter serotonin activate at least 14 different types of gpcrs the different receptors for the same signal are usually expressed in different cell types and they elicit different types of responses now let's see the structure of this g protein coupled receptors the first part of this coupled g protein coupled receptor is the receptor itself g pcrs the receptors which are associated with g proteins have an extracellular domain which is responsible for binding to the signal molecule then they have a transmembrane domain which passes through the membrane seven times and it is a multi pass type of protein and it passes the membrane seven times and they also have a cytosolic domain which is associated with g proteins so now let's see the structure of g proteins which are associated with g protein coupled receptors these g proteins are trimeric in nature they are made up of three subunits alpha beta and gamma subunits the alpha and gamma subunits have lipid anchor which helps the g protein to anchor in the plasma membrane and the alpha subunit is bound to gdp when a g protein in its is in its inactive state it is bound to gdp and when it is bound to gtp it is said to be in its active state so there are two components of g protein coupled receptor the receptor itself that we have seen in the last slide and the g protein which is a tri trimeric protein which is associated with the receptor now let's see the activation of g protein when a signal molecule binds to the gpcr 
So in an active state, in the first upper part of the figure, if you see the G protein is in, is in inactive conformation and it is in GDP bound state. So when an extracellular signal molecule binds to a GPCR, that GPCR will be activated and it will lead to conformational change in the GPCR. This change in conformation will further activate the G protein which is associated with this receptor and it will exchange the GDP to GTP. GTP is present abundantly in cytosol so it can easily bind to the activated G protein and now this G protein can further activate the downstream signaling pathway. Now let us see a small video which will demonstrate the activation of GPCRs after binding to extracellular signal molecule. And we will also see a small video which will explain the importance of GPCRs in drug designing. Many G protein coupled receptors have a large extracellular ligand binding domain. When an appropriate protein ligand binds to this domain, the receptor undergoes a conformational change that is transmitted to its cytosolic regions, which now activate a trimeric GTP binding protein, or G protein for short. As the name implies, a trimeric G protein is composed of three protein subunits called alpha, beta, and gamma. Both the alpha and gamma subunits have covalently attached lipid tails that help anchor the G protein in the plasma membrane. In the absence of a signal, the alpha subunit has a GDP bound, and the G protein is inactive. In some cases, the inactive G protein is associated with the inactive receptor, while in other cases, as shown here, it only binds after the receptor is activated. In either case, an activated receptor induces a conformational change in the alpha subunit, causing the GDP to dissociate. GTP, which is abundant in the cytosol, can now readily bind in place of the GDP. GTP binding causes a further conformational change in the G protein, activating both the alpha subunit and beta gamma complex. In some cases, as shown here, the activated alpha subunit dissociates from the activated beta gamma complex, whereas in other cases, the two activated components stay together. In either case, both of the activated components can now regulate the activity of target proteins in the plasma membrane, as shown here for a GTP-bound alpha subunit. The activated target proteins then relay the signal to other components in the signaling cascade. Eventually, the alpha subunit hydrolyzes its bound GTP to GDP, which inactivates the subunit. This step is often accelerated by the binding of another protein, called a regulator of G-protein signaling, or RGS. The inactivated GDP-bound alpha subunit now reforms an inactive G-protein with a beta-gamma complex, turning off other downstream events. As long as the signaling receptor remains stimulated, it can continue to activate G-proteins. Upon prolonged stimulation, however, the receptors eventually inactivate even if their activating ligands remain bound. In this case, a receptor kinase phosphorylates the cytosolic portions of the activated receptor. Once a receptor has been phosphorylated in this way, it binds with high affinity to an arrestin protein, which inactivates the receptor by preventing its interaction with G proteins. Arrestins also act as adapter proteins and recruit the phosphorylated receptors to clathrin-coated pits from where the receptors are endocytosed and afterwards, they can either be degraded in lysosomes or activate new signaling pathways. G-protein-coupled receptors, GPCRs, have central roles in many physiological functions and diseases. This diverse superfamily includes over 800 members, all sharing a common configuration, passing through the membrane seven times. GPCRs are present on all cells in the body. They pass signals from a variety of extracellular messengers to modulate intracellular pathways via the activation of G proteins and other signaling molecules. GPCRs mediate an incredible array of essential actions in the body, including smooth muscle relaxation and contraction, neurotransmission, immune regulation, and overall metabolism. 
and thus have enormous potential as therapeutic targets for multiple diseases. GPCRs are the largest and single most important family of drug targets in the human body. 25 to 30 percent of current drugs target GPCRs, including many of the best-selling drugs. Despite this, drug development has been encumbered by a lack of structural and mechanistic information about GPCRs and how compounds interact with them. The predominant problem is that GPCRs are too unstable to easily purify and they lose their highly organized structure and activity once removed from the cell membrane, precluding them from use in structure-based drug design. To overcome this problem, Heptaris developed a structure-based drug discovery SBDD platform to transform GPCR drug discovery. Heptari Star Stabilized Receptor Technology forms the backbone of its integrated SBDD platform for targeting GPCRs. Star technology involves the selection of mutations to the protein sequence, which increase thermostability and stabilize GPCRs in their natural states. Once produced, the star GPCR can be purified from cells and still maintain its shape and function. The star GPCR can be readily crystallized together with drug hits to determine the detailed shape of the GPCR and ligand interactions, which can reveal new binding sites and opportunities. A variety of different compounds, ligands, can be screened in silico for their ability to fit the receptor. This information facilitates the precise design of drug candidates with an ideal fit to increase selectivity and a better potential for development success. STARS can also be used to unlock the power of fragment screening for intractable GPCR targets and to help discover novel GPCR targeting antibodies which can have advantages over oral drugs for some diseases. Through this technology, Heptaris is building an exciting pipeline of new medicines to transform treatment options for Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, cancer, migraine, metabolic disease and other indications. Now the GPCRs and how they are responsible for gene regulation, we will see with the help of example. The GPCRs, when activated, they can activate the associated enzymes in the plasma membrane. In this example, if you see, the activated GPCR can activate the associated enzyme adenyl cyclase. This adenyl cyclase enzyme is responsible for synthesis of cyclic AMP. So once activated, adenyl cyclase will lead to increase in cyclic AMP concentration. The increase in cyclic AMP concentration will lead to activation of protein kinases. So if you see in the figure here, the binding of cyclic AMP as adenyl cyclase is activated, it will increase the concentration of cyclic AMP. Once the cyclic AMP concentration is increased, it will bind to protein kinases. Now these protein kinases have two types of subunits. Two subunits are regulatory subunits and two subunits are catalytic subunits. When an cyclic MP binds to the regulatory subunits of protein kinases, they will lead to activation of catalytic subunits and these active catalytic subunits will be released from the regulatory subunits of protein kinases. Once these protein kinases are released, they will activate further uh, proteins or they will phosphorylate the uh, downstream proteins in the signaling pathway. So that we will see the mechanism in detail. Now we will see how GPCRs are responsible for gene regulation. Now when a signal molecule binds to GPCR, it will lead to activation of these GPCRs. In turn, they can activate the associated enzymes. For example, in this case, we will see the example of adenyl cyclase, which is an enzyme associated with GPCRs. So, when a signal molecule binds to GPCR and activates it, it will further lead to activation of enzyme adenyl cyclase. This enzyme is responsible for increase in concentration of cyclic AMP. Adenyl cyclase will synthesize molecules of cyclic AMP and it will lead 
to increase in the concentration of cyclic MP. Once the concentration of cyclic MP increases, it will lead to activation of protein kinase. Now let's see how the activation of protein kinases happens using cyclic MP. When uh, these protein kinases are tetrameric proteins which have two subunits which are regulatory in nature and two subunits which are catalytic in nature. So when a cyclic MP molecule binds to these regulatory subunits, it will lead to conformational change and it will separate the regulatory subunits from catalytic subunits. And such activated subunits will now be released from the regulatory subunit complex. The release of catalytic subunits requires binding of more than two cyclic MP molecules. Thus, it is required for adenyl cyclase to produce cyclic MP in enough concentration so that protein kinases can be activated. When PKA is activated by cyclic MP binding, it phosphorylates a CREP protein on the single serine residue. Now, this CREP protein recruits a transcriptional coactivator called as CREP binding protein. We can also call that as CBP. And this CBP binds to something called as cyclic AMP response element in the target DNA. So cyclic AMP response element which can also be called as CRE is present associated with the active, with, with, associated with the target gene. So this binding of CBP protein to cyclic AMP response element will lead to activation of a particular target gene. So an mRNA will be produced from this activated target gene and then it will further lead to synthesis of proteins in the cytosol and it will lead to change in the gene expression. So we can see the series of events that have happened here. First a signal molecule binds to a GPCR and activates that GPCR. Once the GPCR is activated, it will activate this associated enzyme that is adenylyl cyclase. This activated enzyme will produce cyclic AMP and it will lead to increase in concentration of cyclic AMP. This increase in cyclic AMP concentration can now lead to activation of protein kinases. The catalytic subunit of protein kinases can then phosphorylate CREP protein. This CREP protein will recruit a transcriptional coactivator which is called as CREP binding protein or CBP. This CBP protein can now stimulate or it can bind to a cyclic AMP response element in the genome and it can lead to activation of a particular target gene. So this is how an activation of GPCR can lead to change in the gene expression of associated target genes. Now let us see the mechanism of other class of receptors that is cytokine receptors which activate jack stat signaling pathway. The large family of cytokine receptors includes receptor for many kinds of local mediators, they are collectively called as cytokines, as well as receptors for some hormones such as growth hormone and prolactin. The cytokine receptors are stably associated with cytoplasmic tyrosine kinases which are also called as Janus kinases and short form as JAKs. These JAKs are named after two phase Roman gods. Now these receptors which are present in the cyto, uh, cytoplasm, which are present in the plasma membrane can bind to cytokine and once the cytokine binds to these receptors, they can activate the associated JAKs. Now activation of JAKs can lead to activation of other gene regulatory proteins which are called as STATs. The full form of STATs is signal transducers and activators of transcription. Now let's see the JAK STAT signaling pathway. When a cytokine molecule binds to cytokine receptors, it will bring the two cytokine receptors in close proximity. The binding of cytokine to the cytokine receptor will lead to a conformational change in the receptor in such a way that two domains of the cytokine receptors will come in close proximity. After this, the JAKs which are associated with this cytokine receptors can cross phosphorylate each other. So the JAK present on one side of the cytokine receptor 
will activate the other uh, jack which is present on the second side of cytokine receptor and vice versa. So they can cross phosphorylate each other. Once these jacks are phosphorylated, they will active, they will get activated and they will phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on the cytosolic domain of cytokine receptors. Once these tyrosine residues are phosphorylated on the cytosolic domain of the cytokine receptors, it will create a docking site for the stat proteins. So these phosphorylated tyrosines will act as a docking sites where the stat proteins can come and bind. Once these stat proteins dock on the cytosolic domain of the cytokine receptors, it will lead to phosphorylation of tyrosines on the stat proteins. Once these stat proteins are phosphorylated on the tyrosine amino acids, they can dimerize and this dimer of stat proteins can now dissociate from the cytokine receptors. This dimerized stat proteins, they dimerize through SH2 domain of the stat proteins and once these are dimerized, they can travel to the nucleus and they can bind to cytokine response element in the target gene. So whatever genes which are associated with that particular type of receptor will be activated upon binding of this tag dimer to the cytokine response element which is present in the promoter region of that particular target gene. Once these stat proteins bind there, they will lead to activation of that particular gene transcription. The gene, tra gene that gets transcribed will be further translated into protein in the cytoplasm and this will lead to change in the gene expression. So overall, if you see the sequence of the events, first binding of a particular cytokine or a particular hormone will lead to activation of the cytokine receptors and it will bring them in close proximity. Once they are in close proximity, the cytokine receptors will, uh, the uh, jacks which are present on the cytokine receptors will cross phosphorylate each other. This cross phosphorylation will lead to activation of jacks. This activated jacks can now phosphorylate the cytosolic side of the cytokine receptors on the tyrosine amino acid residue. These phosphorylated tyrosine residues will serve as a docking sites for stat proteins to come and bind. When these stat proteins come and bind to the cytosolic side of the cytokine receptor, they will further phosphorylate the tyrosine residues on the stat proteins. These phosphorylated and activated stat proteins will now dimerize through their SH2 domain and they will dissociate from the cytokine receptor complex. And these dimerized stats can now go and bind to cytokine response element which is present in the promoter region of the target gene and it will lead to the change in gene expression. So this is how a JAK stat signaling pathway functions upon activation by particular cytokine. Cytokine receptors are dimers or trimers and they are stably associated with one, two or four known jacks. The four types of jack that are well known and characterized are jack 1, jack 2, jack 3 and TYK2. The binding of cytokine alters the arrangement and brings these jacks in close proximity and that can lead to transphosphorylation as explained in the previous slide. And these jacks then phosphorylates the tyrosine on the cytokine receptor which will further create the docking site as we have seen in the mechanism of signaling pathway. Now let us see the overview of seven classes of cell surface receptors. In today's session we have discussed two cell surface receptors in detail. The first class that we have discussed was G protein coupled receptor and the second class that we discussed was cytokine receptors. But other than these two types of classes, there are other types of cell surface receptors which are present in the membrane. For example, there are <coughs> receptor tyrosine kinases, there is TGP, TGF beta receptors, there is hedgehog receptors, there are WNT receptors and there are notch receptors. So there are overall seven types of cell surface receptors and their associated family 
which are involved in different types of gene regulations and they have different mechanisms of regulation. So, this is an overview of seven classes of cell surface receptors. So, in summary today we have seen what is cell signaling. We have seen the overview of cell signaling and the associated mechanisms. We have discussed the general principles of cell communication and cell signaling. Then we have seen in detail the structure of G protein coupled receptors and the G proteins. We have also discussed how G proteins can regulate the production of cyclic AMP and how in turn it can regulate the gene expression. Then further we have discussed the structure of cytokine receptors and how a binding of cytokine molecule or hormone molecule can lead to activation of jack stat signaling pathway and how it can alter the gene expression of associated genes. So, to summarize we have seen uh, the basics of uh, cell communication and signaling and we have discussed two classes of cell surface receptors that is G proteins and cytokine receptors. The references that I have used for this particular uh, presentation and discussion are uh, Molecular Cell Biology by Laudish, Molecular Biology of Cell by Bruce Alberts and another book of Cell Biology by Gerald Carr. Thank you.